Welcome to the Local Fit Show. I'm your host, Lauren Conlon. Each week, we bring you the best insights in nutrition, mental health, habit building, training, and more. This week, I'm interviewing my friend, Jeff Black, to talk about leadership and psychedelics. Enjoy the show. All right. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Jeff. <laughs> thank you for having me, Miss Patty Kate, with your hands there. <laughs> I know, right? Like, what is <laughs> I was like, what? Okay. Patty Kate. <laughs> well, I was trying to like uh, signal like the break when we like edit the podcast, but I just <laughs> continued it like as my intro. So if anybody's watching, the- <laughs> I am just, yeah, playing Patty Kate by myself. <laughs> Oh, that's good. As usual, yeah. uh, yep. I'm like 500 podcasts deep and still do dumb shit when I'm introducing people. <laughs> Same but, about, I screw stuff up as a host of the Exos Cartel. I'll be like, what's your last name again? I'm so sorry. You know? know. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> you, yeah, how about you introduce yourself? Yeah, I don't even want to, I don't even want to go there. Uh, but for real, just give us a little bit of background on you, what you do, uh, and then we're going to go into our topics for the day. Yeah, well, um, I feel like this is one of those AOL moments where I'm like ASL. So I'm 41, I'm a male, and I reside in Nashville, Tennessee. But uh, most importantly, that's where my gym is, Iron House Strength and Conditioning. We're going on our seventh year of business in April and have consecutively grown over 50% each year, which is absolutely stellar. Uh, I am now to the point that I have to consider either another location or something even bigger, which is always a good problem to have. But a lot of that is because What we're going to talk about today is leadership uh, because of the empowerment I gave some of the key individuals who've grown that is where we're at. But otherwise, I'm a dad. I've got two kids, uh, full-time dad to one. I own an online coaching brand, uh, Relentless, and I host the Excellence Cartel podcast. And I think, what, I also do the PEC with you. Yeah, the Physique Education Collective, which is cool. You know, I got to meet great coaches like yourself. We met so many cool people traveling the U.S. doing these. Um, And it's been really neat to like see the industry want to get better in areas to help others. So that's something that I know you and I are are very passionate about. And it's kind of a little bit about me, Um, born with a brittle bone disease and kind of was told I'd never walk again and got into walking and then before you know bodybuilding it. That's (laughs) how I fell into that. (laughs) Yeah. Now, um, it's been a weird run. I got started working with Stephen Pressfield. Um, who wrote The Legend of Bagger Vance. Uh, Legend of Bagger Vance, yeah. They had Will Smith and Vince Vaughn in back in the day, but he wrote Turning Pro, which was a very influential book to me. And he's chosen to mentor me as I fin- start working on my book about my journey with my bone disease, all the surgeries I had to have to walk again. And then like what got me into bodybuilding, the catalyst. And then I'm presenting a thesis at the end that I didn't think modern counseling really helped me as much that they gave me spent too much time dwelling on labels when they didn't spend enough time with me just working through some of the memories that it was label it out rather than work through it out. And so very interesting. I don't know. I'll probably catch some fire for it, but uh, <laughs> it'll be something very similar to what Goggins did. Can't hurt me is how it's going to kind of be written from that framing. So I've got 17,000 words down. So I just need about like another 30,000 to go or so. Yeah. How long? I'm trying to think like how long is a standard book? Like <laughs> I, was, I, have, I have no idea. <laughs> he told me to go to 45 or 50,000 words. He said, then we'll murder that baby and then we'll put it back in and you better give me a twins on the next time through. So I'm like, he's like, basically you're going to spend this whole year writing you just write, write, write. And then your whole purpose is to detach. And then an editor is going to go through and red pen my stuff and hurt my feelings. So I was like, oh, sounds oh, great. Yeah. Oh yeah. But, I can imagine they're just going to like. <laughs> yeah. But you know, as like a person who owns business, as you, as you go up that leadership ladder, you know, you're always challenging yourself mm-hmm. and the way that you're, you know, I like to get better is to find out, you know, new challenge myself against new things. I've always been interested in writing. Okay. Well, I'll write a book. Mm-hmm. All right. So, and, you know, go from there. And I think that's how you get better in a lot of other areas because you can get feedback and things you're trying and relate it to other stuff. So it's yeah, good it's, I mean, it's just kind of like what we do with coaching too, right? Like we give someone a challenge and then they execute on that challenge and they maybe execute it flawlessly and we keep the same program or they don't. And we have to adjust based on all these other things. Um, and that feedback is really what's most important for the coach and the client because the, without the feedback, we have no idea, you know, like they could be not executing and they're like, Hey, yeah, it's doing great. And we have no idea. Um, so the feedback really is what's critical, but that's so awesome. I'm super excited that you're going to be writing that. Um, and it's cool to see like that journey. And I'm, I'm excited to hear 
how like obviously you're jazzed up to be writing it now but it'll be interesting to see like at the end of the year how you feel about it if you're like fuck this book or if we're super excited about it <laughs> <laughs> like i hate writing never give up uh, uh <laughs> so it, you know I'll, I'll be honest i looked at it and i was just like i carved out my schedule where i could commit six hours a week and I was like, as long as I can bang out about 2,000 words at a time, which I've been getting about 2,600 for that time, I should be okay. So we'll see. I'm very fortunate that I have a team around me who's allowing me to cut some slack to work on this for myself. So it's been yeah. nice. Which is a perfect pivot, perfect segue <laughs> to, well, to leadership. So I first wanted to start with I mean, we can, we can really go any direction that you want, but I did want to touch on maybe earlier in your career um, as a leader, some areas that you made some mistakes or you maybe weren't a great leader uh, and what you've changed since then. Oh, so for me, leadership started very interesting. I was in it uh, at 22 when I worked for the Department of Homeland Security. They're like, oh, you tested the position, you're a leader. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, you go try to tell that to like 40 and 50 year olds who are saying, why is this 22 year olds a leader over me? Yeah, that doesn't go over really well. So, you know, trying to get people to buy in and things like that, that was very hard for me on an age thing. So what I, I did was I got very fortunate and I asked some of the older people who were leading their teams better than mine. And I was like, okay, how, where am I missing this? And there, one guy, he was a, you don't say a former Marine, you say a Marine, because once a Marine, always a Marine, was very fortunate, Joe, to pull me underneath his wing and kind of give me some stuff. He's like, you got to do better in the way you lead yourself. You can't come back late from your breaks. You can't do this. You can't do that. And there was just little stuff. I was 22. I didn't think about that. What's a minute or two here? What's my belt? Maybe not that way. So the very next day I came into work and I put iron, I put creases on my uniform and I had my shoes polished and I would rule myself a little bit better from day to day. And that was, that was an early on leadership lesson. But what I found as you go up the leadership ladder, and I talked about this in Dallas, your rights go down as your responsibilities go up. And that's a hard thing for a lot of people to like go through and encounter but I can say that leadership is probably the best journey you're ever going to take. And you're always going to make mistakes if you're trying to get better at leadership. And I think that that's the thing where people fail, maybe in the health and fitness industry, more so like coaches who are listening. Um, when people follow you, they're already following you based upon permission that they're giving you to like lead them. So you already have like a leg up. It's just a matter of how well you lead yourself that they pay attention to and, and go from there. And everyone is too afraid to make mistakes because we're so social media driven now. We want this perfection. We want it to look good. We want it to look bad. And I can tell you that my companies were not built that way. My companies were not built by the leadership books and the models that they say that if you go in there and say, hey, Lauren, I'm going to do this and we're going to love it. Well, guess what? Not people buy it. In fact, some people actually stick around to try to hurt your company. Um, and that's a reflection of your leadership as well. So it's a lot, but I mean, like we could go really anywhere, but I think yeah, the biggest thing I, I want to take away is it started <laughs> as simple as me having to understand, like I had to leave myself. Like, yeah, like that's a really, really big started there. And then once I did that, slowly those results build up. Slowly people go, okay, Jeff is doing the stuff. And Jeff's going there and he's getting better and better. And then it slowly goes under. But it's something that, man, if you take a day off, it puts you a month behind mm -hmm. um, in terms of just how people look at you and the currency of things, social currency and stuff like that. I think that's a really great point how, you know, small things, like you said, okay, I, you know, iron my clothes a certain way, I polish my shoes. And obviously that was a very, that job specific response um but taking care of yourself and really leading by example uh applies to every single industry and i think that you know when you feel good and you feel competent and confident about your skills that is going to translate so much more right like there's no way that you can lead a team when you're not really taking care of yourself and you might have all these values and this mission and whatever but you're not living up to it like even if you're like oh you just kind of give yourself a pass give yourself a pass you know like that catches up and at the end of the day you're like damn like i'm not doing what i should be doing or i'm not living how i should be um and i think that 
you know, you can kind of convince yourself for a little while that like, it's okay. Uh, but then over time, you're eventually like, that's going to catch up and you're like, okay, either nobody now is, you know, at this team or at this company, or I'm just, they're, they're all failing. Um, and I'm just being a really shit leader because of all of this. So mm -hmm. I think that holding yourself, leading yourself and also holding yourself accountable um, in certain areas is going to be absolutely essential as a leader in any capacity, because um, it really does start with you. Uh -huh. And uh, otherwise, and especially in this industry, you know, uh, like if we're talking about like the health and fitness industry, right? Like if I'm somebody who is not, I could be saying one thing, but then doing something else. Well, <laughs> where, where is like the continuity there? Like, where is like the brand? Where is like the messaging? If I am saying to live a certain way and then I'm living another way, like I would never want to be disingenuous about that. So I try to share with people like, Hey, this is actually what I'm doing. This is how I'm doing it. Um, you know, we've talked about this, like I could do, I'm terrible sometimes at sharing too much. Cause I'm like, I don't want to share because I have this deep disdain for social media. Um, but I do recognize that if I don't share that, then people really don't know. Right. And they just, they, then if they don't know something, they're just going to assume. So it's like, well, I'd rather put that out there and say, Hey, no, I'm walking the walk this way. This is what we're talking about as a company. I'm also doing this. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I think that that's very, very important. And business owners, they always go for the dollar amount. And that's great. You could go for that dollar amount in any industry. But if you can't lead yourself, you can't sustain what you're trying to chase. And I think that's the one thing that leadership has taught me. For every level of this Jumanji that I'm trying to do, like perspective for the people listening 11 years ago I was going through a divorce I was the one of the lowest of low and I had to file bankruptcy and I was sleeping on my friend's floor on a crappy air mattress that deflated every night and it was like a waterbed when I woke up so you can definitely understand not many women were paying attention to me at this point in my life and all I did was just work either bouncing on the weekends and then running my training company just trying to build it to somewhere now I was on the phone call with a bank earlier trying to figure out how I'm going to get a $5 million loan potentially to do da, 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 da. That didn't happen. The person that was on that floor 11 years ago is not the same person that's here right now. And that was the decision that if I was going to get better, okay, all right, I have to even get better at ruling myself a little bit more and I've got to get smarter in a bunch of areas. And leadership is the ability to kind of say, I don't know crap, even if you know a bunch of crap, to go learn something new. Um, you know, there are many a times, I think me and you can agree, we've sat in rooms that we probably know exactly what's going to be said, but something comes up a little bit differently and something said a little bit differently that makes the whole scope of what you, the lens you're looking through on a situation completely change. And I think that that's the issue of leadership. You have entrepreneurship, being as touted as a sexy thing. And I think most people don't want that. I think what they really want is to be an entrepreneur, which is someone who like works on a business underneath like a business umbrella, you know, but you don't get to the entrepreneurship level unless you can understand what it's like to be a CEO and CEO means leading a bunch of different people in a bunch of different ways at a bunch of different times because everything's in flux. And that's a certain amount of mental health that goes into it. Oh yeah. And what you said about taking away something, you can know, Hey, this is going to be a presentation on whatever. And I've heard this person talk about it in other places. And there's always something that you can take away. Um, that's why I love, like, I love what we do with the PEC so much because not only is it, um, you know, not only are we having an in-person event, but we're having a lot of really wide range of topics, but we're able to touch on things and you can say, okay, I know this person's talking about this. Okay. I can still take something, okay, I liked this. I didn't like that. I'm going to apply this. I'm not going to apply that. I heard somebody ask a question that was referenced into that. That got me thinking about something. Some of my best ideas come from just, I'll be at an, like, at an event taking notes and then I'll have like, this is just because how my brain works. It's like going in 80 <laughs> directions all the time. So I'll be writing notes and then I'll be seeing something else and I'll be thinking about and then I'll be having another idea. And it's just like mat the chaos but then it's oh, like, the chaos. Oh, but it's like, it's like this controlled chaos. And then I can say, okay, well, half of this, well, probably three quarters of this was total shit, but let me take that one cool idea that I had away and let's implement that and change it. Um, and that's one of the things that I love so much about going to different events and just challenging as a leader, really anybody, but as a leader, you really do have to continuously challenge your beliefs because you're going to be put up against people who 
do not always agree or do not always have the same viewpoint. And that doesn't mean that they're wrong, just means that, okay, well, let me maybe potentially expand this lens or kind of shift how I'm looking at something um, and really see it from their perspective. And ultimately that's how, if you are in the space, whether you are, like if you are a coach or a trainer or something, you have to do that if you're going to be able to connect with your clients. There's no way that you'll be able to be an effective communicator to your clients if you can't do that. Yeah, it's like I tell a lot of the coaches who come to me for mentorship or want to like talk to me about like they want to start their own gym or their online coaching and all that. And I'm like, well, great. Here's the first thing you need to know is everybody communicates, but few people connect. And you got to make sure that you're connecting to more than, than the other person next to you in business. And that's kind of like a big thing. And, and I agree with you. I think that those in-person events, those might be the most straining, but the most fun things to take part in. Because you just get to be around so much good energy and good people. Mm -hmm. And the best part is you're around people who are better than you more often than not, if you're in the right rooms. Mm -hmm. And those are always good to be about. And that's what leadership has taught me. If I'm not uncomfortable every day, then I probably didn't do something that I needed to do to make things better for everybody else. Because as you know now, you don't, it wasn't what it was when you first started. So leadership, when you first started, was like, okay, I'll lead myself great. I'll post on social media. I'm doing hip thrust, all the stuff. Yes. I post, I eat the state, you know, the tilapia and I suffer the best with everybody else. Yes. And you know, you only have to do that. And eventually it gets so big. Someone comes along and says, Hey, I really like what you stand for, but yet you don't really know what you stand for. You just know you're doing this thing and you're like, okay, great. And then you bring them on and then you're like, okay, what do I do now? And that is where you, yeah, exactly. And we talked, I talked about that. Um, That was an interesting exercise that I did to shift the cultures of Iron House and Relentless as I made my team sat down and said, who are we? What are our values? What are we going to, and those values are going to be what we hire and fire people by. And I think that that is something that when you're a business owner and you start scaling, you have to understand this is going to be a reality. You're not going to be for everybody. And in fact, that's a good thing. And those values should make sure you're attracting the people that align to your values and you're pushing away people who do not because they will be customer service problems for you. And in order to grow as a leader, you have to identify that this is your reality and identify the values. But most importantly, How do you recruit the people to those values that you're trying to hire? I think it's way easier once you say what you're about. Then people go, oh, yeah, I resonate with that. Or, Or, yeah, no, I don't really think I'm going to like that culture. Like a big one for me is autonomy. We went over that as a team. I said, I don't want to have to follow up with you guys every week just because leadership books say I should check in on you all the time because I'm not that guy. You know what to do. You know your job. You know, you need help. I'm here. I'm going to check in with you every so often, but along the way, have some autonomy. Let's do this. And that was a big value that really took my brands off in all honesty, that one value right there. Yeah. And then, you know, like you said, people know when they sign up, you can say, Hey, this, you know, if you want to work here, like, this is what we stand for. This is who we are. This is the brand. Um, And that makes it a lot easier to attract the right people. Um, and it's just like anything with same thing with, within those businesses, you know, like the clients that are being attracted, like, Hey, here's what we're about. Here's what we represent. And then people are able to see that up front and make their decision. Um, so let's talk a little bit about iron house, because I know when you first started, it was obviously vastly different than it is now. And you are clearly, you know, expanding and potentially even getting a second location or a bigger location. Um, and the gym is already massive. So uh what like take us through that journey and kind of how like what you've done that have been really pivotal things you already mentioned you know sitting down with the team hey here's what our values are let's write all this out so we actually have this framework so people know when they're coming in and and when we need to fire them Um, but what else has kind of shifted over time um so when we first started it was a guy named Derek and me and Derek passed away in 2018 from uh, liver and lung cancer and pancreatic cancer um, he was 37, I believe, at the time. Um, but when we first started, it was because the owner legitimately was just going to close the place. And Derek and I looked at each other and we're like, well, man, we got family. So uh, I kind of like you and I guess you kind of like me. So we like each other enough to do this business. So let's do it. So we went in 50-50 and, and we formed Iron House and we had 42 people. <laughs> <laughs> April 1st of 2015 to 972 as of today, uh, seven years later. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, it's been a wild ride to watch, but really what started, you know, it wasn't like I had this dream that I wanted to be a gym owner. It was a necessity thing. I was an in-person guy, online coaching hadn't taken off. I had about 60, 70 people in person. I had a thick book. I was there all day. I just had to keep that stuff going. We managed to get lucky and expand. The bays next to us came open. We went over, but we started growing at a rate that we couldn't keep up with ourselves. Um, and then when Derek got sick, it was turned to me, at which point JR, who you met at PC, yeah. he um, goes, hey, I think I can help you with your culture. At least start pulling this together a little bit to get the bow going in one direction. And I said, okay, what is it? He goes, there's something from the IT world, but I don't know if it will work for you. And I said, all right, well, you know what? I don't give a shit, I want to try anything. And he goes, okay, well, it's called Strength Finders. He goes, so I need you to take it. So I did the Gallup Strength Finders. And for the first time ever, and I've done the Enneagram and I'm a type five, Lauren knows me. I shall tell you, I will investigate anything to the end of the earth to <laughs> find if it's true or not. Um, but regardless, he, you know, it was the first time I read something and I was like, man, that is really neat. Like, and it was quirky stuff. Like mm -hmm. when I read a book, why do I highlight it and file the pages away and then screw, shoot a picture of it for later recall? Like, oh, because my number one greatest strength is context, my ability to take the past, to merge it to the present, to understand the future, to know where to go. And it was also the first time that I understood like why I could never get anything done about myself. Uh, so meaning like three of my strengths are strategic. I don't have a single execution. So I have a lot of great ideas, but I don't get anything done. So um, Derek got sick. I brought strength finders in. And then Thera <laughs> was working for me part time. And I looked at her and she's like, hey, I think I'm going to need full time. I was like, whoa, aren't you in luck? Because we were growing. And so I bought the gym from his widow, um, came to an agreement and uh, looked at there and I said, okay, I need you to run a gym. And she was like, excuse me? And I said, yeah, I don't know how to do this, but I know how to go create a culture of coaches and I'm gonna go out there and work on that and go be the mayor. So I did, but that was the root of my leadership where it was like, I brought people on and rather than, cause this is the problem. I have this conversation today at lunch and so on. The conversation I have with people in any form of business, whether they want to do a side hustle to a full time is, I don't want my baby being touched by anybody else. Well, how do you think like at the Apple phone we have, wouldn't it be possible if Steve Jobs just didn't keep demanding that it could be done? Everyone reads leadership books and say that he's this raging asshole, fair, but he gave those guys the full autonomy to do what they needed to do to give them the final deliverable product. And that's exactly how I looked at leadership. Because I had read a lot of his book, a lot of the books on Silicon Valley and understood the aggressive startup nature. And I said, you know what? I'm going to bet that more people want to do better if I empower them. And have I missed sometimes? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. But I don't regret a single one because I've given my best and have given theirs. So the culture started shifting in Iron House when I went to the Strength Finder. I started empowering people. I started going with decentralized command that they didn't need to ask me for permission to breathe. You know what I mean? Like, hey, I'll meet with you once a month and we'll go over it. If there's anything I don't like, I'll tell you then and you'll just know. So I was very simple. I told Thera, I want our gym to be the Chick-fil-A of gyms. I will pay whatever I have to do to keep the front of house steady. And I haven't had turnover in my front of house in three years. So, which means, you know that when people come, it's always Katie yeah. or Thera, always Katie or Thera, always Katie or Thera. And that's huge in businesses. Yeah. And, you know, when you go into this stuff and, and you're looking at leading, I decided, okay, my passion is coaching. My passion is getting people to believe in themselves. The gym is just a vehicle for me to get there. Mm -hmm. If I can pay people more money and take better care of families and just do what I need enough to do to be able to keep the growth going, then I was fine. And that is what I've chosen to do. And that's what Iron House Sparky represents. I mean, it isn't me. And you know that, you know, the audience doesn't know that, but I, in the early stages, yeah, it was sheer sweat equity of me just being in there 16 hour days. But over time, there's been nothing more rewarding than being able to create the environment I've created. And that didn't happen unless I decided to get better at leadership, picking up mentors, reading different books, listening to different podcasts, you know, me and you are fans of Jocko. His books are really good. Dichotomy and leadership is a great read. Um, but it was a lot of that instilling through strength finders and the idea that, you know what, what do we got to lose? Try something new.
Yeah, and I'm actually having JR on the podcast in a few weeks. So I'm super excited. Oh, he, you know, I think his presentation was probably one of the more brilliant ones at PEC because he got everybody to think about the question of what perception really is. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and like, it was, it was a really great thing. And if any of your listeners are listening, the Gallup Strength Finder is like the one that I recommend over all. It, all it was up. super. So I'm very hesitant with like quizzes and all that, right? Like, I'm just kind of like, oh, okay, sure. You know, like the, the very, very like nerdy, like has to be validated kind of person inside of me is like, I'm going to step back from that. But I was like, you know, let me just check into this. Seems legit. You know, you had talked about it. I saw the presentation. I was looking it up a little more and I was like, fuck it. Like, let me just, let me just get it. And it's super interesting. And, and you know, a lot of the stuff is whenever you take a personality test or, or you know, a strict, whatever this is called, I guess we'll call it a personality test. As long as you're being honest, like you're kind of going to know, right? Like you're not going to be totally surprised by the findings. Um, but it's still interesting the way that it's put together. And it does, like you said, really make things really clear. Like my um, number one was like input. And it makes so much sense, you know what I mean? Because I'm somebody who is like, you like collect and archive like people, information, ideas, things. Uh -huh. And like my second is learner. And like, you just love learning for the sake of learning. And you want everybody to want to learn as much as you want to learn, <laughs> like all these different things. And, and it was really interesting to see um, and one of the girls on my team, one of my coaches has, Sam has actually taken it as well. So it was interesting to see, we had some that were very similar and then some that were polar opposite because that's how we are. Like we're very similar in certain areas and total opposites in others. But it's, it's nice because like you said, you know, like to you and Thera, you know, you need that, right? Like she's an executor and like that is what runs a successful gym. Um, and kind of you moving away from that, like being in the gym all the time to working on it and allowing yeah. other people, um, autonomy is huge. And that, that autonomy is, is everything for, you know, from employees all the way to clients, um, and, you know, yourself too, but it is so powerful to, you know, empower a client or empower an employee to be like, Hey, you know, you, here's the tools, like let's develop these skills. And I want you to go and do this. I'm still here for accountability. I'm still here to check in. But you being able to do this on your own um, and believe that you can do this on your own is really why you're going to be successful in the long term. Like the clients who are successful for life aren't successful because they follow a perfect program where they track everything every day. That's not why. It's because no, they're, they're autonomous. Empowered. Yeah, they're empowered and they have yeah. autonomy over their decisions. And they're competent enough to execute on those things on a consistent basis. It might look a little different every day, um, yeah. but that's really where you're going to see the big, you know, progress. So that's super awesome to hear. I mean, I've been to the gym several times now. It's incredible. And I can't wait to go back this summer. I, um, I will say this though. The one thing that I think that Strength Finder did, what that was a unique thing, because it just popped in my head. So I want to let you know, because I'll be curious to see yeah. how well this ages. <laughs> is it's been very nice for my coaches and my staff because I have front of house and I have coaches, obviously, right? I have some underneath Relentless, some contracts on 1099. So I have a plethora of people on my team. But using the strength finders and saying, I'm only holding you accountable to these five things and did you exploit these five things best has been a big relief for them. Like, yeah. like and how I've engaged with them because I'm like, okay, well, my conversations always go to that. How's your five strengths? What are you doing to develop those? Because you spend so many people get so bent over their weaknesses. I'm like, look, man, I can't even make my weaknesses better. I mean, so in mine's execution, I got pieces of paper everywhere and it is what it is. But strength finders, like that really helped Thera and I because Thera and I had friction because she thought I had all these responsibilities as an owner. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I don't know how to execute, make all that happen. And then when we did Strength Finder, JR went, well, Jeff, you have three strategic pieces. Thera has one or none. And Jeff, you have, Thera, you have three execution pieces, but no strategic. And me and her like, things were like, oh, we're mates. You know what I mean? <laughs> but there was a really good book about it called Rocket Fuel. And it talks about visionary and integrator role. And I think that if you're going to go into business, I think even you and I both can say this. You can't do all this by yourself. Empowered people creates empowered results, creates empowered culture. Look no further than the first form. There's your beacon in the industry. That's the flywheel. I actually talked about that at the BBC. Like they built the great thing in the flywheel where everything goes in one direction. But to circle and package this up nicely, if you're really looking to understand, even if you're a client, 
some of the things that make you tick. If you just want to know, like, why do I kind of do the things I do? Why do I think the things I do? Or why do I have a hard time understanding the things I don't, I, I want to understand, like I genuinely mean to, but I can't seem to get clicked. Strength Finder clarified a little bit for me. Once I realized like, okay, I'm just not a checker off a list kind of guy. I felt suddenly better about my life and all my skills. I was like, oh, so I can validated be right now. I've been seen and heard. <laughs> I got more validation there than I ever did from a counselor. So I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, I, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, a lot of people, when I first shared it, like they weren't, a lot of people who are in like corporate roles have, have heard of it, but not everybody else outside of it. Big five is my favorite because it's all, mm -hmm. it is scientifically validated. Um, and it really goes over the five big personality dimension traits. Uh, and that's helped me a lot, right? Like I can, I, I know, again, these are all things that I know, you know, I took the quiz, I fucking answered the questions. I know that I'm super neurotic. I know that I'm super conscientious. I know that I'm super extroverted, right? Like I know all these things, but mm -hmm. it helps to understand. And again, because I like to collect and archive information, I'm just interested in learning all that and saying, okay, when I'm acting a certain way, negatively or positively, how is this, you know, how is this being exploited or is this improved because of, you know, where I am? And mm. like, as an extrovert, I'm somebody who like has to go and I know that I have to have interesting conversations. I like to have like social interaction. I like to go places. Um, and that's not like a better or a worse thing, right? It's just like, here's the reality and I'm gonna put myself in situations to make sure that I'm doing that so that I can use my strengths and thrive. If I were to say like, no, 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 like I need to just buckle down and do this and just be on my computer all day. And I, most days I'm on my computer, right? But I have to sandwich in these other things and other trips and other events and mm -hmm. podcasts and conversations. Like I have to go do that. Otherwise I don't feel like a fulfilled person and I don't feel like I'm doing my best job either. So I think that it's, it's super interesting to, to recognize those strengths. And yeah, obviously we, you know, there's, sometimes like a, a weakness is so glaring that like we do need to work on it right like obviously oh, yeah. if it's clearly right like the whole point of that is not to say like don't ever work on your weaknesses but um really bolstering your strengths and especially as a leader and having a team you can say okay i want to have people who are really good in these different areas like you don't like to what you said mm -hmm. being able to deploy this decentralized command you don't have to be good at everything that's not the point nobody is great at everything um, especially if you're really, really good at like one certain area, you're going to be lagging in others. There's just, I've never met one person yeah. who is fantastic in one area who has everything else together. They, they just don't. <laughs> so, I agree with you hundred percent. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's just, <clears throat> Hey, like they're really good at this. They're going to be okay at a few other things. And they're going to have a team to bolster up and to, you know, provide support where needed. And that works, you know, you have obviously this in the in-person and online with Relentless as well. Um, and you're able to navigate both of those things. What I'm interested in, and I know we've talked about this a little bit before, kind of in our own conversations uh, and briefly here, but I, you know, obviously the online world has exploded. You know, it has, you know, we're hitting yeah. this huge, I, I don't know, I feel like the bubble is going to burst at some point, right? Um, but I'm starting to see, and I've talked to other people who are, who are very experienced in the industry as well. There is this deep desire for like this in-person and more intimate connection. And I don't I know how much of that is just the internet or how much of that is the internet plus the past two years, right? Like there's a lot of things that could be influencing this. Um, but I really think that there's going to be a big shift to um, in-person stuff. And I would just be interested to see what trends you've seen, if any, that relate to this with Iron House. I mean, obviously you guys are growing, um, but have you been hearing this from people? Or are they like, oh, I'm really interested in one-on-one -on -one training? Um, or like, is there just any kind of rumblings around that? So we do small group training. We have like two trainers that do exclusively one-on-one -on -one, and those are more like wicked cases. Like the person like legitimately needs that kind of eyesight. I developed a small group training model, which is about four or five people per hour. <clears throat> the way my gym is, you know, you can kind of make that work. Yeah. I started figuring out people like to be around other people and kind of have like a little community. And that's what Iron House known as. We're known as like the cheers in Nashville. I mean, just some people just show up and hang out. I mean, we did a cornhole tournament, had like 50 people show up. And it was just like weird. Okay. But, you know, um, <clears throat> not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
you know, there's like, it, it, it's, I, I could go, my gut says, I think it's the last two years more than anything. We're noticing an uptick coaches are starting to like have to like double down on like taking more on i've adjusted my hours slightly to make for a better flow on the gym floor and if you've been listening to all the commercials they all talk about a flexible work environment now um flex environments are here to stay you're going to have people coming to show you up in in the in-person and here's my thing everyone's pandering for the online 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 i get to sit at home da 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 you know what most online coaches have, have in common with a lot of other people out there is they're depressed. Do you know how nice it is for me to go leave my house and know people are paying for me to show up to want to talk to them while I put them through a workout? That's it. And it's, it's great money. And the lifetime value of my in-person clients, like Thera told me, I'm like almost at three years. I like literally generally can't take anyone in person unless it's like a referral referral but they stay online people you're lucky if you keep them a year in that ecosystem because it's just hard um but i think that the what you're hearing matches up to what i'm seeing start trickle through we've had the biggest months you it's just been growing since november in all honesty it's just been like doo -doo 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 -doo. and i've told people the problem i think that gyms are going to run into is we don't have enough good quality coaches and it's the same problem that we're seeing in the online space. Yeah, a lot of people know how to market, but guess what? You can't market your bullshit in person. <laughs> Some people have been around a gym. You can see that in person. That, that looks way different than in a copy, filtered, glamorous, well-produced video you put on Instagram. I promise you that much. <laughs> so, um, But I, I, I think I agree with you. And I think that most people spend too much time going out there in the world. They should be looking in their backyard and trying to secure up their local environments. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And growth. I've talked to, you know, my friend, Dr. Joe, who I've had on this podcast as well, who has, you know, 30 years of experience in the industry. And, you know, he's gone back and forth with many different models, of course. And, but he's really solidified a, you know, in-person facility now in Evansville, Indiana, which is a very small place. Damn. And, yeah, it's great. There. Yeah, yeah. But like you're like, oh, what the fuck? And he's like, honestly, it is absolutely incredible. Like to just the difference um that you know that makes. And you know, it's something that I've thought about for a long time. Actually, hilarious the where I'm sitting, I started my office like I started renting here because I thought, oh, I'm going to start doing some in-person consults. You know what I mean? Because I really enjoy that. It like plays on my strengths and all of this. And then literally the week after I signed is when everything shut down COVID in hit. March. Yeah. I was like, this is hilarious because I'm not impulsive. I'm very deliberate, very slow. And I was like, you know what? This seems like a really good idea. I'm going to jump into it. And then I was like, motherfucker. <laughs> but, <laughs> but all that to say... <laughs> I, you know, I'm like, I need, I do need to do that. You know, I do need, I have the space. I do want to commit to that because um, it's something that I know that can play on my strengths and I, and I, I truly enjoy it. So I agree. I think that there is a, there's so much that is, that is online, you know, and there's, there's obviously we both have online businesses. I absolutely love it. People are listening to this online all over the world. Yeah, no, it's um, great. So there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. We, we love that, but I do think that, um, you know, just in general, people are really, really wanting that sense of community. And, you know, to be fair, you can have an online business and then travel and then meet people you know when i travel i go and try to meet clients and stuff and like that's amazing you know we have a great time doing that um and still able to make an impact or something like a pc which is like a big event everybody can get together so there's a lot of different ways but i think that the in-person training group training um you know presentations versus webinars all that like in-person consults all that stuff i really think is uh is going to be substantially different in the next few years like i'm, I'm I agree. excited to see kind of a more blended hybrid model you know of sorts i agree and i think that the dirty secret that's going to come out in all this is we talked about this on our podcast the other day with phil viz about the mental health of coaches and i'll be interested to see because you and i both know it's not so hard to deal with 10 maybe even 20 but once you start cranking 50 
80 and 100, like some of these numbers, it it's hard and you're going to have some mental health stuff. And I'm in, because right now, 2020 either made people better or it made them worse. The majority of people have made worse. Let's just be honest, right? And those people are going to go to the gym. Those are the people who are going to burden you with all their anxieties on our stuff. And being a coach is, you have to learn to deal with that. I mean, I do counseling once a month with a guy who's trained to work with CEOs just so I can offload my problems to him because it's not fair for me to drag around in my personal relationships, you know, that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. What are coaches going to do when you have 50 clients and 20 of them have eating disorders? How are you going to deal with that mental health? And I think that, I think we're about to see a lot of shifts. And I think that that's going to be the tidal wave. I think you're going to see the tidal wave go from online, shifting into in-person, and yeah. then it'll you know, balance itself out, I think, after that. And I don't care. I always say this, and people can give me shit. I don't, I don't care. I understand that I'm an extrovert, and there are people who are much more introverted than me. And I understand mm-hmm. that this is a spectrum. But people need human interaction, no matter how introverted you are. The the difference between introverts and extroverts is not about human contact. It's just about how much, right? But you still need some, (laughs) you know? So if you can't tell me that if you sit behind a computer screen all day and you never interact with anybody outside of your home, that you could be in this mentally healthy place, there's no fucking way. There's no chance. So we both know coaches who do that, you know, and it's like, this is only going to work for so long. And, you know, there's a very small minority of people who are just so introverted and just really don't need a lot of interaction. And they're super happy to do that. But the majority of people I think are telling themselves that they are, and they're just, they're, they're not, and they're using that to cope with other stuff. Cause I've used work to cope with plenty of my issues before, you know what I mean? Like, Oh, I'm busy. I'm busy. Like, it's just an easy out, especially as a business owner. There's always something to do. <laughs> yeah. It, so, like, it's like prep life. I got prep. Sorry. You yes. know, you just run competitors. We either run away coaches. We either run away to a competition. We run away to our business. A or B never yeah. stand to deal with our problems. Gotta go. <laughs> yeah. Which one do you want to choose? C is not an option, which is confusing. So yeah, I think that it's going to be a really interesting shift. Uh, and this is a great segue actually too, to our psychedelic talk. So <laughs> I'm <laughs> interested. we're just killing the segues today. Um, I, I, you know, obviously you've talked about this very openly. You had a whole presentation, you know, working on or intertwining <laughs> that um, at one of the events. And I just think that yeah. You know, there's, I mean, the research that's coming out on psychedelics is, is incredible, especially, I mean, honestly, what, what impresses me the most out of all of the literature is definitely the MDMA uh, phase two trials that have been published like that, that to me is just outstanding uh, in the context of, you know, severe, you know, PTSD and just what we're seeing and just understanding how, you know, MDMA works in comparison to other things. Now, to be very, very clear, this is psychotherapy assisted MDMA. Um, you know, a lot of people will read a study and be like, oh, cool, let me just go take Molly. And you're like, that's not what happened. Uh, this, is very, the same. this is very different. First of all, it's, yeah, but you know what I mean? Like, they'll just take that and then just, anyways. Um, so these are all personal anecdotes that, that you want to share. Obviously, this is not, this is just, what's the disclaimer? This is not medical advice. We're not a doctor. Um, but I just thought it would be interesting to share how it has affected your personal and professional life uh, because, you know, clearly there's been a profound impact. So, oh man. So I think it's important for everyone to understand that I never smoked pot until I was 32. Okay. Um, so I was raised very conservative, very Roman Catholic, just Knoxville, Tennessee was my life. And you know, I've always been very liberal, libertarian. I mean, I'm just, I'm one of those people like, yeah, as long as you don't met in my lane, I don't really care about you. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, so I smoked pot and I was kind of like, oh, this is interesting. It was the first time I could kind of like expand outside. Um, and then in 19, or was it not 19? I wish, I wish. Um, in 2017, I read a book called Stealing Fire. I know, like, like 1962. 1962. <laughs> um, no, in 2017, I read a book called Stealing Fire, and it's written by Steve Cobbler. And he was talking about uh, in there microdosing psychedelics. And I found it absolutely fascinating that they would give it to Google engineers. So a Google engineer couldn't solve a problem. No matter how hard you try it, they would give a mic a little small dose of LSD. So perspective for you, for your listeners, 100 micrograms is a dose they say that would be a macro trip. 
So they were taking like 10 micrograms, so a micro dose. Um, and then they would come back no a few hours later. <laughs> yeah, they would come back a few hours later and be able to solve the problem. And so, but what I, it then led me to go down the rabbit hole of heart rate variability because they were monitoring their heart rate variability. And this is what I presented about at one of the PECs was I was doing psychedelics heavily and I researched like, I showed graphs to them. I did shrooms for six weeks and then LSD for six weeks and what it did with my HRV. And then every single one of them, it made my HRV better. And HRV is a signal, basically, like it's a sign, a lens in your ontomic nervous system. Are you more stressed or not stressed? Um, and I can tell you that I would take the microdose and I would feel more at peace. I wouldn't want to be on my phone. There were just weird things, but I noticed like slowly over time, there were things about me that were changing. I was more patient. I was able to sit in discomfort with people's emotions and feelings easier. Um, just slow. Is that when I started talking about this in 2017, because I was open about it, I said, hey, I'm going to do this and da, da, da. And there was like very little out there on it. It was just the John Hopkins study. One study that said seven out of 10 people said they would do shrooms again before they were died because they were all terminal cancer people. And they said it was the most profound thing they'd ever done. I'm like, well, if you're dying of cancer and this is pretty profound, I definitely want in. So that's what led me down it. But um, I have done it all. I actually uh, smoked peyote with um, a shaman out in Arizona and did it in the TP with the, all that. So it was very spiritual. Um, I've never done it for freelancing purposes in the sense that I just want to get screwed up because I understand the powerful drugs that they really are and the potential they really have. And I've talked about this that I know we pulled the genie out of the bottle on this one, but I mean, there are people now smoking DMT in 18, 19 years old. Like you haven't been through anything yet. Like life hasn't hit you yet. And, and for someone like me who, for example, I had to keep my leg broken for three months straight and I never slept for three months. So there were certain things that kind of residual effects that stayed with me for a long time. Um, and back in May, I actually did the assisted MDMA therapy. I talked about it in one post and that was it. Um, I had a guy who was familiar with it. He was actually out of California. He was in Nashville and was a listener of my podcast and offered to put me through it. And it was probably one of the greatest experiences I ever had. Like they're true about that. Um, I can actually don't mind being, being like, this will sound awful, but you know, you go through certain life experiences, you don't necessarily like to be touched or cuddled or there's certain things that just make you feel weird or awkward. I remember when my kids would hug me, there were times I'd be like, this is really weird because I wasn't able to really be touched by my parents because I went through so many surgeries. Like they couldn't be in a hospital bed with me. They couldn't really comfort me. There were certain things that just weren't there. And then when I was born, I was born with both my legs broken. So when, my, when you change a baby, you pick their legs up to change them. So I would scream. So my parents would never hold me. So just being touched was very unnatural. But after doing that therapy, it feels good. Like it feels like everyone else has always said it should, that I would sit there and be like, why don't I have this feeling? You know what I mean? And it, it's just amazing to me that these things can happen because of these drugs, but they were all done in the right settings. It wasn't ever like, oh, I just took a bag of shrooms and went and sat out at the lake and hoped for the best experience ever. It was making sure I had guides and stuff like that. But you're talking to a person that has had a suicide attempt, that has taken pills, uh, Prozac, Xanax, everything that they could throw at me for every single issue that would possibly to three to four, to a level, a leveler, to a stabilizer, to an upper, to a downer, you name it. And I never felt good. I never felt myself. I felt detached. I didn't want to live. I didn't want to feel. I didn't feel, so why live? And then I finally said, well, this is no way to live. And so I just said, well, screw this. And then I stumbled on this stuff. And I can say that it gave me my life back. And there, I've had a lot of conversations with people about this. And I get it. It's very uncomfortable because I was raised, don't do drugs. Drugs will fry your brain. Drugs will kill you. You're going to take a hit of acid. And you're going to end up like the OJ man in the prison who thinks like he's a glass of OJ juice. And if you tip him over, you're going to spill him. But none of that stuff is true. In fact, if you go into like some of the literatures, the mysteries and some of the stuff to do with the Greeks and even they think, you know, Christianity 
and what these psychedelics with ergot, which is the chemical uh, precursor to LSD, they now know those things were around like in the BC time. Like they now know beyond a shadow of doubt that these were doing it. We actually, I read a book called Intoxication. It was written by a guy that says, he argued that the, I think it's the four sense is really our, our keen sense for wanting to be screwed up. That animals, cats get into catnip, certain animals get into certain things because we're always chasing to be screwed up. And why do we have like cannabis receptors in our body? It's like going through the stone ape theory. You know, we ate shrooms. Well, we had serotonin receptors, which allowed us to pop off differently than other creatures, you know? <laughs> so there's just a lot in science is coming. And I think that if you're a listener, you have to understand that the government for a couple of decades put this stuff away and it was by misuse. The CIA people going to different cities, just giving people ass and not telling them what they did. Well, that was not going to end good. You know what I mean? Like, uh, so with this comes a lot of responsibility. And if you're a person who is depressed or anxious, I could tell you as a person who just didn't really give a shit about living much, that these things really gave me my life back. And if you're at your wit's end, Regardless of what you believe politically or religious, I encourage you to pull that lens back, sit down with someone who's maybe done it, research it yourself. There's tons of great info out there. You can't go wrong with what's out there. There's You live in the information age now. There's no excuse, yeah. but they're, they're coming about. It's not some ho ho hocus pocus stuff. And uh, I'm, I can actually tell you that I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I took a risk. I'm glad I lost some of the friends that I did. And I'm glad that I hurt my business the way that I did. And I'm glad that I did all that stuff because I'm five years later, it looks to all be right. You know what I mean? And sometimes you got to take a chance. You got to do what's best for you. And that's all that was to me. Hey, you don't have to live every day in my head. I do. And I don't like what's going on in my head. I want out. And that's what led me down that road. And I'm forever grateful that I took that chance. Rock bottom does an interesting thing to people. <laughs> yeah, rock bottom is a very unique place. And I feel like, um, you know, unfortunately people have to experience that in different aspects. You know, I think that we all go through different rock bottoms, whether it's relationships or kind of like whatever's in your head or a, you know, business failure or, um, you know, bad eating relationships, like whatever it is, like there's so many different things that we can do. Um, but until you really get there, I feel like it's hard. It, it's, it's easy to judge too. Like, Oh, why can't you just get it together? You know, you're like, well, you never, maybe never experienced this. Right. Um, yeah. and there really is so much information out now. It is not a fringe thing and, and they are really powerful. So I think it is something that people have to be aware of that power. It's not something to just take lightly. I mean, no drugs are something to be taken lightly. in, in my opinion, <laughs> um, you know, people do people take like party drugs just to get fucked up. Right. Um, but you know, you also have to be aware of that as well. It's not just like, you don't just say, oh, because this is, you know, Coke is fun. Like, let me just take it. You're like, you don't know what's in that, right? So uh, everything has a risk, right? Is basically all I was saying um, with that. And there- I mean, I, I, you go ahead, but I'm a pro user. And I was even saying, I got stuck not too long ago. And I even had a guide and a setting and I had to take a Xanax to come out because they, it started pulling me in, you know? And that's why you want to have that stuff, you know, and I'm, you're talking on what they quote unquote call a psychonaut because I've done over a hundred trips and I'm like, okay, I still got pulled into one. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I yeah. still started losing touch reality because time was standing still. So what you're saying is hundred percent true. And that's where I kind of get concerned when people talk to me about it, you know, cause the first thing is where can I get some? I'm like, well, I don't know where you could get this scheduled one illegal drug from them, <laughs> you know, that puts me away for 30 years. I have no clue where you would get that from. But yeah, people it, are crazy. First of all, yeah. it's, so, it's like it's just like you know when people are like, "Oh my god, I wish people would talk more openly about their steroid use." You're like, you know that it's illegal, right? That's why they don't talk about it on the internet to strangers. <laughs> like my only concern though with the guided counseling stuff is what's going to happen when the counselors misuse this. Does it get taken away from those of us who could really use? Because you know you're putting it into other people's hands. It's like. We talked about before we went live, the knowledge we're putting into people's hands with the PEC, even though we have some basic stuff on there, we got some really high end, like niche stuff that, you know, we're putting this information out there in people's hands. At what point do we get bit by the yeah. snake per se and go, shit, we should not have done that. Yeah. And I'm afraid that we're going to go through that bell curve before that really happens though. 
it's possible, right? Because obviously there's mm. it's human nature, right? Um, one thing that's cool, at least from at least from the MDMA study, I'm still a side too, but the the one paper I'm really thinking of right now with um, it was 15 sites and um, all there was no site specific differences, which is pretty rad. So it's all different therapists, um, all just you know taught to administer the same you know kind of protocols, etc. And there was in three different countries as well. So that's pretty excellent to see that now doesn't mean that it's not gonna get fucked up but uh it's it is pretty interesting to see that there was so many benefits and especially with mdma because it does work on all the different receptors you know it's serotonin dopamine and epinephrine versus obviously lsd is more serotonin based um psilocybin is more dopaminergic so it's just was that the one with the soldiers because they did one up in um fort campbell in kentucky recently because my Mm -hmm. buddy who I hang out with actually got into the trials in MDMA. Nice. This doesn't um, save this marriage. Now he was on, he did four active deployments. So he was real bad. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. The, uh, the, the veteran, well, I do a whole podcast on veteran PTSD, which is, Oh just, God. Yes. It's it is. Um, it's so frustrating uh, knowing, you know, a lot of veterans and, and just seeing the treatment. So, you know, when you learn about trauma and you recognize that there's so much that stems from that, and then you have all these side effects. Oh, I can't sleep. Okay. Well, you just need mm-hmm. sleeping meds. You're like, it's not because you have a sleeping problem. You have a trauma problem. Right. Or, you know, I'm always in pain. Okay. We'll just give you more pain. meds. like, like there are so many things that root back to trauma, especially in that community that are just not being addressed. Um, but in the study that I was talking about, um, I, they did take people who were suicidal, which is, you know, obviously a pretty big gamble and it did not increase suicide, um, in any of the, the, the treatment group, which was pretty profound. The only two people who said out of the hundred, there was two people who said, um, that they felt an increase and they were actually in the placebo group. So, um, it was not an effect of, of the drug. So that's, that's interesting. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so it's, I think there's a lot of positives that are going to start coming out from all this. Oh, yes. Yes. But it's, you know, they're saying they're trying, I mean, they've been doing this research for 40, 30, 40 years. So I think by, they were projecting by the end of 2023, the so last that I heard, um, they should be able to have um, psychotherapy assisted MDMA for PTSD treatment. Um, by the end of 2023. So we'll see. I mean, they, already have the, they already have the ketamine treatment, which is approved, but the problem with ketamine is that typically the results are pretty short. In yeah, comparison. ketamine didn't last. Yeah. And, but which makes sense. Of course, they approve that one first so they can fucking give you more and fucking make more money, but. That's expensive too. That yeah. one time I did it was a grand or something like that. And I remember it was what? really, yeah, you got to have your therapist there. Like there was like, oh, yeah, no, it was expensive as hell. And I did it because I just wanted, I mean, at this point I was like, well, I've already smoked peyote and kind of, you know, smoked the image. I might as well go all the way. And I I went and did it and I didn't, it didn't really do it. I mean, it was cool to be like outside myself and like see how my body operates. But if I had to go in an order of what has impacted me the most, it would be LSD1, MDMA2. So I see where those studies are going. I think the MDA was very, the MDA was crucial to me on the sense of like the body keeps score whereas the lsd was very crucial to me on the ability to re allow my mind to get a fresh paint per se that makes so sense. that's yeah that was i think they're going to hold different houses for what they end up doing which is great because that's like in everything it should be different wheelhouses but that's exciting to hear 2023 hell yeah i know forward. well that's that's what this guy's been saying but he's also been doing the shit for, and like you know he obviously knows, he knows. yeah, yeah. I, We'll see, but fingers crossed. Um, they've been, I mean, phase two is the longest trial, and then phase three is pretty much just kind of like tying a bow on it and making sure yeah. the last stuff's good. So, should be good to go. Um, I, I haven't heard anything about psilocybin as far as the um, the timeline. The, the thing with psilocybin is that it is so reality shattering in comparison to something like MDMA. Like, MDMA is a lot more palatable to people, especially with PTSD that I think that that's going to have a harder time getting approved just because if you are somebody who maybe isn't able to, to handle that, uh, that's where I think a lot of people have struggled with maybe too much or you're not being able to come out of it, uh, unfortunately. So whereas MDMA is a little bit more, I don't want to say mild because mild is not the, wrong, the right word, but it's just a little bit more palatable, it sounds like, uh, in that setting. 
Yeah, you're not shifting into like different realms. So if you're like a listener, when you do shrooms or LSD, like you kind of like, if you've watched Flash, like Earth 2, you kind of feel like you're somewhere else where MDMA is you're very present with your body. You very, you feel again. It's very interesting in that regard. Yeah. Um, I will say this though, if any listener is listening, when you go down these rabbit holes, you will see that the mother of all psychedelics is known as DMT. Don't do that. I've smoked it once and I will never do it again. Yeah. It was the, uh, it's the, if you read some studies on it, there's a reason why you don't do that one. That one completely tears you apart and shatters you in ways that you just never, it was really intense. And I've known people who've done that for their first time. And then they look at these things as awful things. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's like trying to jump into your diet and you don't even like are going to try to like stock your fridge with the right food. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's just a bad idea to even try to yeah. go do that route. Like, so begin with p- the best. And also like <laughs> reality is shattered. <laughs> so it's yeah, like, no. But the biggest thing like is I just, consequences. yeah, no. And I, I just want people to take that way because, you know, there's a lot of, when it comes to this stuff, like, oh, screw it. You can't do this. Can't do that. I'm like, no, you can really hurt yourself and you can most importantly hurt other people if you're not paying attention to some of the rules. So if you're going to do this, um, take some of the advice, read some of the stuff, or be more than happy, I'm sure, to hit you up, or I will with stuff. But there's just so many good things. Start small and figure out your what you really need to work on first, and that will help you from there. Yeah. So as always, this was a great conversation. And I was like, how do we tie in leadership and psychedelics? I was like, fuck it. We're just going to do both. <laughs> hey, that is I, us. <laughs> I will say this, like I, when I got into them, that was when my leadership journey started really taking a hard turn. Like when I really had to like grow and get uncomfortable and think. And when I was going, I mean, you and I both know you're not a creative person if you're a depressed person for the most part. And you're not a momentum person when you're depressed. And so I just didn't feel good. And then once I did, a lot of things changed. I think that the thing I could take away if you want to tie this all together and put a bow tie on this is leadership is a culmination of a lot of things. One, it's the ability to rule yourself. Two, it's the ability to understand that you don't know it all. And three, it's the idea that you need to get help too uh, in order to go. And that sometimes even means mental help along the way uh, to make sure that your sanity is taken because or taken care of because you're going to be taking care of a lot of people. That's what a leader does. You take care of a lot of people, a lot of responsibilities, and you want to make sure you can handle it. And that's the biggest thing I would say out of tie the psychedelics in there. Hell yeah, that was a perfect ending. Nailed it. <laughs> um, all right, so if people want to learn more about what you, so Iron House in, what is the actual city? I mean, I know it's It's Nashville, Nashville but... Tennessee, but Hermitage is right outside. Okay. It's right I'm like, I know, yeah. like, I know um, it's right outside Nashville. Uh, yeah. And then- uh excellence cartel you guys have a really great podcast yeah the excellence cartel i host it with jason theobald and jeffrey sue they're not as great as i am but uh they're good they're a good time um and then the pc yep physique education collective uh we're doing a new one that'll be pc6 june 3rd 4th in nashville um that will go live here in the next week or two on the excellencecartel.com but uh you'll be up there visiting because your good friend chanel she's presenting she's got a great presentation um we'll be announcing the ticket but friday night we're going to do a like a plated dinner and a cornhole tournament at the gym saturday is the main ticket and then that night we're looking at viping at the gay bar for the drag show um at which point then we'll roll out and see all of nashville um just kind of oh, now i'm definitely coming <laughs> yeah you gotta have a balance you know like i'm going to show you the country music but i'm also going to show you the best gay bar that you've ever been to like i pinky swear it's gonna be the best time um this is hilarious but yeah no that's a little bit about me if you want to know more you can find me on instagram under jeff unbreakable black and that's usually where i hang out though i'm gonna get into tiktok i'm starting okay. to get sold on tiktok i'm not going to do stupid dances but I'm going to do some, I, the dances make me just cringe. No, that's like, why. So honestly, that's why I was so <laughs> against it for so long, because I was like, first of all, I just, I'm just not a dancer. I'm, I'm just not, uh, I don't enjoy it. I'm not good at it. And I was like, this is legitimately pointless. Like there's nothing here now. Obviously I've started to do more of like the voiceover ones because there's like funny clips that you can use that you can relate to like everything I want to do is tied back to education and learning and right. 
So it's been interesting to take clips and do that. Um, so I have slowly gotten on to doing those, like doing more reels and stuff like that uh, through that. So it is, it is funny how it's like, oh my God, like I was like, I would never make one of these. And then now it's like, oh my God, <laughs> I posted like one, you know, whatever, a few days ago. And it's just, it is just funny how things like that change. Um, but all that's great. We will put that in the is. information. Yeah. I'm like, uh. Put the information in the show notes. Um, if you guys like this week's episode, please share it. This is the best way you can support our show to check out our coaching services, courses we offer and additional content we put out. Visit teamlocofit.com and follow us on Instagram at teamlocofit.